All right, guys, chapter number 11 takes us into a very different branch of mathematics from what we've been doing really the entire year so far here in Algebra 2. We're moving away from solving equations and graphing functions, and chapter 11 is just meant to give you guys a little bit of a preview into the world of statistics and probability. So a lot of you guys who are uh, going to be finishing Algebra 2 this year signed up to take statistics uh, as your math course next year. This is a little bit of a preview of the type of math you might see in part of that course, but certainly certainly not the whole thing. So before we learn, you know, how, how likely you are to uh, get a royal flush in poker, that's coming later in the chapter, we're going to start talking about some counting things. And, and eventually we're going to get into permutations and combinations today. But at first, we better start off with something simpler, the fundamental counting principle, which sounds kind of silly, but here goes. That says, and I'll go ahead and read this off. You guys can put it in your notes, but we'll explain it in a second. The total number of possible outcomes in an event is always going to be equal to the product. So remember, that's that means that we're multiplying of the number of options that we have in each choice to be made in the event. And if you understood what that meant right there, hey, good for you. But most people need to see that in action just a little bit. So pause the video if you need to, write that down, and then let's see where the fundamental counting principle can be useful. All right. Here's the first thing. To get dressed in the morning, you're going to have to make some choices about what it is that you're going to wear. So you open up your closet and you see here that you've got six shirts to choose from. You've got four pairs of pants. You've got five pairs of socks and then three different pairs of shoes. So the question now becomes how many different outfits could you possibly make? In order for us to be able to figure out probability, which is a goal later in this chapter, we first have to know how many total different things could conceivably happen. And that's where the fundamental counting principle comes into play. So if we want to figure out the total number of outfits that are possible here, you're going to multiply all of the number of options you have for each choice. And choice number one, which shirt am I going to wear today? Well, I've got six options right there, so I start with a six. Then we're going to multiply that by, all right, second choice, how many pairs of pants am I going to wear? And I've got four options there. So we're going to multiply the six possible shirts by the four possible pairs of pants. Five different pairs of socks means we're going to multiply by five here. And then three pairs of shoes will multiply that by three as well. So you guys will probably grab your calculator at this point right here. I, of course, would do things a weird way. I'd probably say that 4 times 5 is 20, 6 times 3 is 18, and that's going to make 360. And that means, guys, that in all the different ways that you could put together one shirt, one pair of pants, one pair of socks, and one pair of shoes, you could make 360 unique outfits there based on these numbers. So really all we're doing is multiplying all of this stuff together. Not a real hard concept. Okay, so this next one right here, guys, let's talk about another case here where you've got to make some decisions in your life. You go to a sandwich shop, and I wanted to say Subway, but that'd be copyright infringement, and I didn't pay the royalties for that. So anyway, you're going to go to your local sandwich shop, and you're going to order a sandwich, and you've got a whole bunch of options. So for starters, you get to pick which bread you want, and the sub shop here has white wheat, or a wrap. So there's three different options you could choose for bread. For meat, you could do ham, turkey, tuna, or steak. We've got four options right there. Cheese, one, two, three, four options there. Got it. You can put a sauce on there. Mayo, mustard, ranch, southwest, or teriyaki, which I hope I spelled right. And there's five options right there. Now at this point, this seems like the last problem all over again. We would just multiply the 3 times 4 times the 4 times the 5 and get, I think, 240 right there. But now the plot thickens a little bit. Additionally, you can choose as many toppings as you would like here. And I was going to say veggies, but let me think. Tomato's not a veggie, and neither is avocado, but close enough. So unlike the previous choices we had to make where it was one or the other, like, for example, when you went to choose a bread, you could have white bread, or wheat bread, or you could get a wrap, but you could not do both of those. You couldn't do a sandwich that was white bread and wheat bread. Likewise, you couldn't do a sandwich, according to this, that was both ham and turkey. It was one or the other. But when we start moving into veggies, or toppings as I call them right here, it's not lettuce or tomato. You could have lettuce and no tomato, or you could have tomato and no lettuce. Or you could have, yes, lettuce, yes, tomato. Or you could have, no lettuce, no tomato. 
So what this actually is, guys, let's count them here. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different toppings that you could put on that sandwich. Each one of those is a yes or no question. Do you want lettuce? Yes or no. So there's two options there for lettuce. Do you want tomato? Yes or no. Two options for tomato. Same for pickle, same for peppers, same for onion, same for avocado. So I'm going to multiply the 3 times the 4 times the 4 times the 5, but then I'm going to multiply all of that by 6 twos, which of course would be much faster to type into my calculator as 2 to the 6th power. So let's go ahead and answer the question, guys. To come up with this, we would multiply 3 times 4 times 4 times 5, and then with all of the yes or no questions, we're going to multiply that by 2 to the 6th power. Now again, guys, I'm sorry for this. I don't have a TI-84 on this calculator here, so or excuse me, on this iPad. So I'm going to go here and let me just clear everything out. No, I wanted clear history. That's not what I wanted. All right, clear history. There we go. And let's multiply what we just said right there. 3 times 4 times 4 times 5 and then multiplied by 2 to the 6th power. I think I did that right. Let me double check that. 3, 4, 4, 5, and then 2 to the 6th. This should be a pretty big number here then, guys. So with all of those options there, 15,360 is the total number of ways that we could make a unique sandwich at this local shop right here. And in actuality, anybody who's been to Subway knows that I've actually shortchanged you quite a bit. There are a lot more options than that. So when you actually get into Subway with all of the things that could happen, that number I'm pretty sure is well into the millions beyond that. But I think you get the point here. And I thought I had, whoop, 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 there you go, one more question similar to this. How many ways can five friends be seated in a five-passenger car if only two of them can drive? So let's get working on this, guys. We're going to start thinking about the number of options we have for each choice, all right? And so I'd probably start off right here with the driver's spot right there. And because only two of them can drive, that means we only have two options for who to put in the driver's seat. But beyond that, then, any one of the five friends can sit in the passenger seat. So once we've already chosen a driver, that means we have four people left to choose from for who can go in that passenger seat. So this is important now, guys, for the first one out of these problems. We, we made a choice early on who's going to be our driver, and then that limits the number of people we can choose for the subsequent uh, events. After we've chosen a driver and a front passenger, now we go to the back seat. There's three people available for the first seat, two for the second, and by the time you figure out who sits in the middle in the back, there's only one person left right here that that could be. So this is the way we would multiply this one out. That two times four is going to be an eight. Three times two is six. Eight times six is 48 times one. There's 48 different possible ways we could arrange these passengers here. So those are three examples, guys, of what the fundamental counting principle looks like. You're basically just multiplying options. Okay, and I had one more for you right here, okay? And this is actually a, a little harbinger of what's going to come later on in this section right here. I'll come back to it in a bit. How many three-number locker combinations are possible on a 50-number dial? And if I'm not mistaken, you guys at DHS have lockers that have 50 numbers on the dials there. I believe they go from 0 to 49. And, of course, every locker combination is going to be 3. And I've thrown a couple of phrases at you here that we haven't talked about, but I bet if you think about it, you can probably figure out what it means with replacement and without replacement. With replacement means that after you select a number, you were to, at least theoretically, put that number back in the pool then, and you could select the same number a second time and maybe even a third time. So if that happened, let's think about the three numbers you're going to choose for your locker combination. Well, for the first number, you've got 50 options right there for what that first number could be. Then, with replacing it, let's say you pick a, a, a 25, everybody, for your first number, you would think about taking that 25 and putting it back in the pool. You could then select another 25 there, which means you've got 50 options again for the second number, and sure enough, 50 for the third. Now, let's see if we can do this without a calculator. 5 times 5 is 25, times another 5 is 125, and then there's 1, 
two, three zeros that come at the end of that number. So there are 125,000 possible combinations on your locker if you were going to get three numbers out of a pool of 50. Now, the second variation on this, what if we do this without replacement? And what that means is you're not allowed to use the same number twice. Well, we start off still with 50 options for the first number, but now you can't use the 25 or 32 or you know 39 or whatever it was you used for the first number, you can't use it for the second. So you're now down to 49 options for the second number. And for the third, you can't use the number you drew first, you can't use the number you drew second, but everything else is fair game. You're now at 48 options there, guys, for that third number. So this should end up being a little bit less than that 125,000, guys. So 50 times 49 times 48 is going to get us 117,600. All right, six. There we go. And then the third one I just threw in for fun right here. What if the same number cannot be used twice in a row? So once more, we've got three numbers to choose. You've got 50 here for the first one. For the second number, you can't use the number that you just used. Can't use two in a row here, so that would be a 49. But for the third number now, this number could be any number other than this one right here. But it is okay if that third number is equal to the first one. That gives us a 49 yet again there, guys. So let's multiply that one out. 50 times 49. Really, there were two 49s, so I'll just square that one. And that's somewhere in between. 120,050. 120,050. So those are kind of three variations on a very similar problem right there, each one with slightly different rules for what it is that you're able to do or not do when choosing your locker combination. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is a word that I don't believe you guys have learned in any math class up until now, but I could be wrong. That word is factorials. And the definition of a factorial, we're not going to put it in words, guys. We're just going to write it out. A number, n, with an exclamation point after it. Factorial means the following. You're going to start by writing that number n all by itself. And then you're going to multiply it by the number n minus 1, which is 1 less than the number you started with. Then you subtract another 1 from that and get n minus 2. And you keep doing this pattern n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 all the way down until you get to 1. And that's when you stop. So that is the definition of what n factorial means. Now, I should note right here, guys, this only works here when n, when n must be be a, it has to be a positive, nope, 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 I take that back. N has to be, what would I say here, guys, an integer, and we're going to say greater than or equal to zero. So technically, that means if I remember my number theories right from back in the day, N has to be a whole number, because the formal definition of whole numbers is that they cannot be negative, but nobody really knows what that means, and I might be wrong about it too. So N has to be an integer, no fractions, no decimals, and it can't be negative. That's what we're saying right here. So Excuse me, let's see a few of these in action right here. So 4 factorial, using the definition, that means we start with a 4 and we multiply it by the next smaller integer, which would be a 3 and then a 2, and we always go down to 1 and we stop right there. Now, this one isn't that bad to do by hand, but lucky for us, our calculator has a feature that's going to make that pretty easy for us. Um, obviously, guys, I could just type in here by hand 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 and get an answer of 24, and it's not that difficult to do. But your calculator, your TI-84, will do this for you. What you guys are going to want to do, and I'm sorry, I just have to talk you through this, is type in the number 4. And then for you guys here, there's a couple of ways to get to it. I think the easiest way is to hit the green alpha button on the left, and then you're going to hit the window button, which is F2 up at the top. So alpha, F2, and then if you type in a number 9, that's going to give you the exclamation point here, the factorial that you wanted. Now on my calculator, boy, that's convenient. It's right there, all right? And you end up with 24. But for you guys, we might want to make a little note of how it was that we did that. So we hit the second, nope, I take that back. We did the alpha 
button first, which is green on your calculator. Then we pressed F2, which was the window key. Let me do this again, alpha F2. And then we type in number nine, which is the exclamation point, the factorial. So I bring that up, everybody, because, all right, for factorial, it wasn't that hard to type all that into the calculator and get the answer of 24. But with nine factorial, that's a pain in the butt. I don't want to type in nine times eight times seven times six times eight, all the way down to one. So we would want to do that in our calculator here. Okay, guys? In fact, I'll, I'll do it with you uh, on my 84 on my computer, even though you guys can't see me doing this right now. So where am I here? All right, let's escape out of there. Okay, second quit. All right, here we go, guys. So let me clear out what I have right there. We would type in a nine, and then we would hit alpha, F2, and then number nine again, and that gets us, whew, here's a big number right here. Hopefully you got the same thing I did, 362,000. 880. So these numbers get big in a hurry. Now on example C here, I wanted you guys to look at a fraction now, 37 factorial divided by 36 factorial. Those are going to be really, really, really big numbers, but I want to show you guys a little shortcut for this. This is actually much easier than you think. 37 factorial means, and don't worry, I'm not going to write it all down, it means 37 times 36 times 35. Okay, I get it. So times dot, 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 and we'll take that all the way down to times 1. And then down in the denominator, 36 factorial means 36 times 35 times, okay, I get it, dot, 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 all the way until we get to a 1. And what I'm hoping you guys remember from earlier on this year when we were dealing with some rational functions in chapter 8, anytime you've got a fraction, numerator and denominator, with identical factors, those factors will cancel each other out. The 36 on the top cancels out with the 36 on the bottom. So do the 35s and the 34s and the 33s and every factor all the way down to the 1. What that means is that the entire denominator cancels out with all of this and the only thing left is that 37 there in the numerator, guys. So Relax. We're not going to make you do much factorial work by hand. You'll always have your calculator with you, but it's actually not as scary as you might think for how to do some of these problems. So if I was going to try the same little trick on D, the numerator here would be 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 and all the way down to 1. The denominator would just be 9 times 8 times 7. So what's going to cancel, guys? The 11 is going to stay, the 10 is going to stay, but then the 9 all the way through 1 cancels with the 9 all the way through 1 in the denominator, and we're just left with the product of 11 times 10, which is going to be 110. So you could absolutely use your calculator in order to do that, but this is kind of a way to explain that answer. And the last example with factorials I wanted to do with you guys is zero factorial, which is a tricky little problem here, guys. Everybody wants to look at that and tell me that the answer is zero. And unfortunately, guys, that is not correct. But I'm going to tell you why. So we're going to make a quick little chart. You guys don't need to put this in your notes if you don't want to. But real quick, all right, five factorial, four factorial, three factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial, and now, of course, the 0 factorial that we are interested in. Guys, mathematics is nothing but the study of patterns. So here we go. We already did 4 factorial a while ago. That was 24. 5 factorial would have been 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Well, that's 20, and that's 6 right there times 1. That's 120. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is just 6. 2 factorial, 2 times 1, which is 2. And 1 factorial, you start with a 1 and you end with a 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So most people are pretty comfortable with these five statements right here uh, on the screen. So now the question is, what is the pattern that's happening right here? Can I decode that? And can I apply that now to figure out what zero factorial is? So how do we get from 120 to 24? The answer to that is interesting, guys. The 5 factorial came from 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The 4 factorial came from 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So the only factor 
that 5 factorial has that 4 factorial does not is that 5 right there. That means that 24, which is this right here, multiplied by that 5 gets you 120. Working backwards now, if you were to take 120 and divide it by 5, that would get you 24. Okay, how then do you get from 24 to 6? Well, the 6, the 3 factorial, came from 3 times 2 times 1. Now this just had an extra factor of 4. And if we divide that out, oh, 24 divided by 4 gets you 6. I think I see a pattern right now. How do we get from 6 to 2? We divide by 3. How do we get from 2 to 1? Uh-huh, we divide by 2. So now I'm starting to see the pattern to all of these factorials right here. And now the moment of truth, everybody. If I don't know what 0 factorial is, let me just follow the pattern in red. How do I get there? I take this value right here, which is 1, and I divide it by 1. 1 divided by 1, I'm no math major, kids, JK, yes I am, is going to get you 1 here. And that is the little mystery that we needed right there. 0 factorial, everybody, is equal to 1, and that's the reason why. You just kind of go down that pattern. Now, in case anybody was wondering, the next thing in that pattern here would be a negative 1 factorial, but you're about to run into a really big problem here. If you don't know what that is, we would try to follow the same pattern, and now we would be dividing by, uh-oh, 0. And any number, including negative 1, divided by 0, you guys, is undefined. So there is no such thing as a negative number's factorial right there. So that's why we said back at the beginning of the last page right here that n has to be an integer greater than or equal to 0. You cannot take negative 1 factorial, negative 2 factorial, negative 18 factorial. They do not exist. All right, so that's kind of a quick explanation of what factorials look like. All right, guys, that's about a halfway point in these notes. In just a minute, we're about to get into the concepts here of permutations and commuta uh, combinations, excuse me, uh, but I'm going to stop that one for a second right there, and we'll come back and make a second video in just a moment.